Definition of a commercial motor vehicle. Any self-propelled or towed vehicle used in commerce to transport passengers or property when has a gross vehicle weight rating or gross vehicle weight of 10,000 of one pounds or more as transporting hazardous materials or transporting passengers. Uh, CDLs, you got your class A, your class B, passenger and property, and also your class C, which really we don't deal with a whole lot on that. A class D license, it's smaller vehicles, right? Anything under, we got, I should get my, my cheat sheet in. Anything under 26,000 pounds, if you look under at your regular license, your class D covers you up to 26,000 pounds towing a trailer under 10,000 pounds, okay? That's your class D license, that's for everybody. If you're right at 26,000 pounds, you still don't need a CDL. It's only when you add that one, 26,001, do you get drawn into a CDL requirement. So this, you've got the power unit at 27, towing a trailer over 10 for a combination of uh, 37,000, you need an A or a B license. And that one is because the trailer doesn't break the 10,000 pound mark. Right. Yeah. And this one you would need a class A because the power unit's at 10. Trailer is over 10,000 pounds for a total of 27,000, so you would need a class A license. And something that we run into roadside with a lot of people is that, and just talking with the public, is class A or B licenses apply to everybody, not you know, whether you're working or not. If you are driving a uh, truck and trailer that requires you, that meets those weights, you need to have a class A license or a class B license, whether you were in commerce or not. So that is something that we can run into. There are exceptions for farmers and recreational vehicles and that type of thing. Yeah. Um. So I have a question then. We have an RV that for farm rescue that we pull around. Yeah. <laughs> if you're using an RV for the actual business, it's not technically an RV though. So you'd want to look at the rating of the of the chassis, and if it's greater than twenty six thousand, it's going to be a B license. And if you pull a trailer behind it more than ten, then it would be an A license. To give you a kind of an example, uh, uh, let's say that you have an RV that you use for your personal use. Okay, you don't need a CDL to operate that. You're not involved in a commercial operation. You're not using it. That's your own personal. You use it for your personal. But if you go over to Indiana and you get hired to transport that same uh, recreational vehicle to a dealer so that he can sell it, now you're for hire. Now you need a CDL in order to drive that. Thank God for AARP. Yeah. Keep us, uh, <laughs> so we can go out and buy our big exactly. buses and drive them exactly. get old. So. CDL endorsements and restrictions. Uh, you've got your double, triple trailers, passenger vehicles, your tank vehicles, uh, placable amounts of hazmat, and then the X is the hazmat and tank. So, A couple of things that are changing the tank vehicle um, is going to be changing to a thousand gallons. Uh, just a straight thousand gallon tank anything over a thousand gallons right now it's anything over 119 gallons on something that requires a cdl but it's going to be changing to a straight thousand gallons i don't know if it's changed i think it might the federal might have changed already but the, the states have till 2014 to catch up now the fuel trailer is a little different uh, you're going to probably need a hazardous endorsement on anything more than 119 gallons because that's what we consider to be a bulk package uh, or a cargo tank. So anything over 119 gallons is going to be required to be placarded. And then if it's required to be placarded, you're going to be required to have a hazmat endorsement to transport it. Uh, and that, that requires background checks and fingerprinting and some other stuff. Um, the other thing is the double triple trailers I don't know if you guys use uh, uh, load dividers or Jeeps they call them to transport anything but if you ha have load dividers or Jeeps 
you would be required to have a doubles and triples endorsement for that also. This is just to let you know that the penalties that occur in your personal vehicle now affect your CDL as of 2005, it went into effect. So it's been in effect for quite a few years, uh, but a lot of people are still, don't realize if you get a DUI in your passenger vehicle, you lose your CDL privileges just for a year. Uh, you get three uh, excessive speeding violations, you lose your CDL license for 90 days. So uh, it, it makes a difference on how you conduct yourself in your personal vehicle. Required paperwork, um, and this is would be what we would ask you roadside or anywhere for an inspection. Your current cab card, which is your registration, current proof of insurance, your driver's daily inspection report for the previous day, uh, driver's license, health card, logbook if required, and that has to be current to the last change of duty, which would be your last stop, basically. Uh, this is an example of what your typical health card looks like required information on that. And hours of service for federal and state. Your different driver statuses, you've got your off-duty, your sleeper berth, driving, and on-duty time not driving. Your 11 and 14 hour rule, 395.3a is what, in the federal code is what covers hours of service. Uh, no matter, or no motor carrier shall permit or require any driver used by it to drive, nor shall any driver drive more than 11 cumulative hours following 10 consecutive hours off duty, and for any period after the end of the 14th hour after coming on duty following 10 consecutive. Um, you guys understand the 11 and 14? Have you ever, pretty much? I do, I do. Okay. You got 11 hours of drive time that you can work and you got a 14 hour work day to do that in basically after 10 consecutive off. And that's what we look at in your log, in your log book. 60, 70 hour, I heard, I see that that was a, a question. Um, for the 60 hour, after having been on duty for 60 hours in any seven consecutive days, if the motor carrier does not operate every day of the week, at the scales, everybody that we see coming through there pretty much is a seven day a week operation. I would assume that that's yours is the same. So you all would be 70 hour operators. Eight consecutive days if the motor carrier operates every seven, every day of the week. Um, 10 consecutive hours off duty would be off duty time, continuous sleeper berth. Yeah. That has changed the off duty. Before you could not be sitting in your cab and consider that as off duty time. Now you can. So, before that would have to be considered on duty, not driving time, but that has changed. Yeah, for the leave the responsibility of yep. the claimant. And they did that, I think, to accommodate the smaller operators, so that don't necessarily have a sleeper berth. The 100 air mile radius driver uh, for property carrying vehicles, you're exempt from keeping a logbook if you meet all of these requirements. You operate within 100 air mile radius of the normal work reporting location. You're released from work within 12 hours of starting work. You have had at least 10 hours off duty between the on-duty periods. You don't exceed 11 hours of driving and the carrier maintains written time records. So everything there needs to be met in order to claim that exemption. If you don't meet any or one of those, then you should be using a logbook for your time, time record. So 150 air mile radius driver, you know, for a non-CDL driver, you're exempt, uh, basically the same thing, you're exempt from a, a logbook if you operate within 150 air miles, which is roughly 172 ground miles. You've had the 10 hours off, don't exceed 11 hours, uh, doesn't drive after the 14th hour after coming on duty in five days of any period of seven consecutive days does not drive after the 16th hour after coming on duty on two days of any period of seven consecutive. And again, the carrier maintains written time records. The difference between the 100 and the 150, it go back one year. If you read on there, release from work within 12 hours. So if you have a CDL driver and he's trying to use this, 
This basically says he cannot do anything for the company after the 12th hour. He has to be relieved of responsibility on his way home. Done. The 150 allows them to still work, but they can't drive once they reach the 14th or the 16th hour. Now one thing that, uh, what, that we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, when I'm working is um, I'll ask the drivers how they keep track of their time, and they don't know. They can't tell me how they keep track of their time. So it's important that the employer explains to the driver that you're on time records or you're on time cards. Because if I'm doing an inspection in the field and I ask the driver, how do you keep track of your time? And he says, well, we don't. Well, you're getting a ticket then. Because you always, always, always have to have a logbook unless you're exempt from having a logbook. Well, one of the exemptions is that the carrier maintains written time records and the drivers have to know that. So that's up to the employer to explain to the driver that if you get stopped, you have to tell him that you're on time records. And that's the employer's job because if we don't know. Right. And thank you for phrasing it that way, Mitch. And if we, it's absolutely and, right. And if we ask you and you tell me we don't keep time records because we don't have to, well, you're getting a ticket and you're getting placed out of service. Yep. And that could happen even though you don't deserve it. So it's important that you explain that to the drivers. And even, even some of the bosses don't know because you'll stop the boss and he says, well, I'm salary, I pay myself a salary. Yeah. So you don't punch a clock? No, I'm, I just pay myself a wage every month. Well, you're not keeping time records, so you're just as much at fault as the yeah. guy you got working for. Normal work reporting location means that you're starting and stopping in the same spot every day. Um, so say you're trying to use that 100 air mile exemption. Uh, it, it, you start in Moorhead, but now at the end of the day, you're parking all your vehicles in Fergus Falls. You can't use it anymore then. You have to use a logbook for that day. Or you're starting in Moorhead and you're, you're ending in Castleton you have to use a logbook for that day. Once you get to Castleton, then you can reestablish your 100 air mile. And it's going to be the same for the ag exemption that we got coming up. The day you're moving, you're going to have to have a logbook. Once you're there, you can use the exemption. When you move again, you got to recapture your days and fill up log pages and make sure you're within the 60, 70 hour, all that stuff. This one is a reminder, it doesn't exempt you from the 60-70 hour rule. Okay? It exempts you from keeping a log book. So you're having so you're doing time records and you're working 12 or 14 or 16 hours a day. But once you get to either 60 or 70 hours, you're still required to fall under those rules and you can't drive if you're beyond the 60 or 70 hour rule. You can keep working, you just can't drive. You can work all you want. Yeah. You can work till you drop over, but you just can't drive. And there's the 34 hour restart. You can explain that to that. Yep. So once you've maxed out your 70, and you're at your 70, you need to take a 34 hour restart to get that back to zero again. So you have to take 34 consecutive hours off duty to restart from zero. And then you're, you're good to go again. The reason they, they came up with this is industry pushed for this because uh, in the past we had drivers that were, say you're, you're at your 70 hour, or maybe you're up to 80 hours, okay? Well, you had two days off in the first part of your eight day period. Uh, to get your hours back, you have to get to a day that has hours that you worked to make them go away. Well, if you had two days off, that means you're going to be sitting for three days before you're going to get hours back where you can drive. This allows you to take a day and a half off, reset your clock, and away you go. But it was industry that pushed for this. Can you reset that clock at any time then? Anytime, right? Anytime. So like with us, let's say, you know, we work a couple days and we get rained out for a day or two and then we start up again. So as long as there's a 34 hour break in there, we can restart that. Yep. 
that's where the time records and all that stuff is important to keep those because if you're not keeping the records, you're, you're going to wind up in trouble for that too, for not having any records of what you're working. So they're just basically showing a, a, a driver that worked a bunch of hours, would have been over the 70, but then because he took a restart on the seventh day, he was he's down to just nine hours instead of 70 and a half hours. Uh, part 395 does not apply to drivers transporting ag commodities or farm supplies for ag purposes within the state as such transportation is limited to a 100 air mile radius from the source distribution point and conducted during planting harvesting seasons as determined by the state. And that's not correct. Ours is March 15th to December 15th and North Dakota is year round. Yeah, for a year round. Uh, it does allow in Minnesota for the transportation of sugar beads and feed during the winter months and still be able to use it, but, but not for hauling grain. So they, this, they can claim this? They can use this, uh, but like I said, it, it limits you to that 100 air mile radius and once you leave that farm, you have to get to another farm to reestablish your 100 air mile radius. So the day that you leave the farm in Castleton and you're going to a farm in Fergus Falls you have to make sure you're within your 60 70 you're not over your 11 or your 14 and then once you get to Fergus then you can start using this 100 air mile exception again post trip inspection report is prepared at the completion of the tour of duty your work day for each vehicle driven you list all defects or deficiencies discovered and signed off by the driver and the carrier must maintain a copy for three months. The biggest thing with the post trip is to list the violations at the end of the day, and then you turn that into the motor carrier. Right. And then the, it's the motor carrier's responsibility to look that over and say, okay, we need to get that stuff fixed. Okay. okay. Then if you as a driver have to determine, is this going to affect the safety of the vehicle I'm going to drive? because whose butt's on the line? There's your really the driver. Yeah, right? the driver's always responsible for whatever happens with the truck. I'll guarantee if you get out there with something that's not safe and you cause an accident, it's you're gonna be at the top of the list on the lawsuit that comes down the pike. So by you turning this into the carrier and them signing off of it, does that relieve you of some of the responsibility possibly? Okay, you're, you're saying, okay, this is what's wrong with the truck, but you tell me what you want to do with it. It's okay, you can drive it, or we're going to fix it. If it's, if it's a critical item, you probably shouldn't drive it, and we'll, that's coming up here shortly. And then the other thing is, is if uh, one guy drives it today, and another guy drives it tomorrow, this is, the, the post trip is key. Because if you drove it and you wrote down that it had a tire that was low on air and you aired it up, now he comes the next day, he looks at your inspection report, now he already knows that one of the tires had a problem. So it gives him a clue that, hey, I can go check that tire to make sure it's okay. Or a light was out, you turned it into the carrier, you left a copy in the truck, he comes and looks, oh, there's a light out. Now part of his pre-trip is he's going to go look at that light to make sure it's working. So it's it was designed for slip seat operations where one guy is driving it one day and another guy is driving it the next day, but it applies to everybody. Okay. So there again, what Dwayne was basically just saying before driving, the driver must be satisfied the vehicle is in safe operating condition. View the last inspection report, see if the defects have been repaired or do not need to be repaired, and signed by the person doing repairs and sign the report if defects were correct. And, and I, I would guess that if, if I asked everybody in this room what, what to you mean safe operating condition, we'd probably have 10 or 12 different answers. Because one guy says, you know, I'm not driving it like that. The next day, goes, ah, it's no big deal, I can drive with that. You know, so uh, you really gotta look at, is it gonna be something that's a safety issue? Uh, you've got a clearance light out. Could we write you a ticket for the clearance light not working? Sure. 
but is it going to affect the safety of the vehicle? Probably not. Now, if you don't have any brake lights on the back of the truck, is that going to affect the safety of the vehicle? Somebody comes up behind you and you stop, uh, are they going to know you're stopping? So, that's what you got to look at. So annual inspections on trucks and trailers or single units or combinations. Federal requirement for interstate is any vehicle or combination with a gross vehicle weight rating over 10,000 pounds. Any size required to be placarded and it's designed to transport 60 or more passengers including the driver. The requirements for the annual inspection, for proof of the annual inspection, you can either have a decal or you can have the long form or a combination of the two or whatever. So either one. Either one. Suffice. And, and if it's a Minnesota plated vehicle, it's required to have a Minnesota annual. North Dakota doesn't have a mandatory inspection program, um, but um, their their laws are the same as ours for in-state stuff. It's twenty six thousand, and uh, the, with some exceptions or not. Do you have exceptions for farmers or anything? Yeah, yeah. Well, not for the safety stuff though. They have to have the annual inspection. They have to have you know the safety stuff. But um, as long as they're intrastate, they're um, the, yeah, the farm is in as long as they, you know, the 150 miles. Okay. But pretty much anywhere you go, a vehicle over 26,000 for sure is going to have to have it. And if you travel interstate, then it drops down to 10. Yeah. So if you got support vehicles like a pickup and a header trailer, they're going to have to, the, the, the pickup and the header trailer are both going to have to have annual inspection. That's where we see the, the biggest problem. The, the semis of, that are pulling the combine, everybody knows they have to have annual inspections. It's the pickups of the smaller support vehicles that, that have to have annual inspections. Okay, you, know, you have to be careful of is that the header trailers are still the same as they were 20 years ago, but they're putting bigger and heavier headers on, right. and we're finding they're overweight, and we're assessing overload fees. Oh, for the scale in it or whatever, bridging it, bridge laws or whatever? No, just, just the, well, the, just, just the, the 550 the pounds per square inch that we allow on the tire weight rating. They go over the tire weight rating? They go over the tire weight rating? The new trailers we just received in on, for the header carts are rated up to 18,000 pounds. Are they? A critical items list on your inspections. Brake systems, coupling devices, exhaust system, frame, fuel system, lighting, safe loading, steering mechanism, suspension, tires, van, open top trailer, bodies, wheels and rims, windshield wipers, emergency exits on buses. So any of these items would, if there's a violation, could possibly put you out of service. Everybody knows the tread depth for tires and stuff like that. And, and the lighting devices, you don't see clearance lights or marker lights as a critical item listed. They're talking about things that could possibly be a safety hazard if you don't have them working. So minimum uh, thickness on brakes, the lining is a quarter of an inch. And like that one, you can see that big gap in the center there, there's like no shoe left at all. Right. It's measured at the center of the shoe and there's nothing left of the pad. Steering tire. Big old crack. That was frame rail. That was over by Wadena. Both both frame rails were exactly the same. And then they passed an annual inspection like 300 miles before I stopped. And <laughs> one of our local gravel trucks. That's the that bracket holds the uh, the uh, torque rod that keeps the axle in line. And the whole thing is broken loose, cracked loose, so. Blood net missing. This was on a steering axle. Just a squeak. That's another steering tire with a crack on the inside edge. That basically was a plastic fuel tank he shoved underneath the truck and just bungee cord it and used a plumber strap to hold it in place. This one, the the ball is loose. Uh, and it was a trailer with a, a 20 
some thousand pounds of load on it, had a backhoe on it, and uh, the, the reason it was loose was they used a ball that was rated for 2,500 pounds. It had a 5 8 inch shaft, and it was a one inch hole on the pintle, and the block washer actually went up inside the, the hole, so it loosened up. So they've got a 2,500 pound ball with a 20,000 pound load on behind it stuffed into the pencil. So, and this one, and this one, I should have spent a little more time, but this one, the tie rod end moves up and down about a quarter of an inch. Uh, this one is where the front axle is actually moving. The spring is so loose that the front axle moves. So the out of service decal. Yep. And the out of service, I, I noticed Jerry's got the out of service book here. If you guys want to look at that and see what some of the things that are that are out of service per se, uh, might not be a bad idea to kind of look it over and just get an idea. Uh, they do sell it at C CVSA. You got to go to CVSA.org. You can buy a copy of the out of service. Uh, we don't give them out, but you can purchase one if you want to. So once we're done with our inspection desk, we give you the report. You sign off that you received it. You give it to your carrier. Uh, they look at it. They address all the defects. They must be repaired before the vehicle is redispatched if it's equipment. And they sign off on it that it has been addressed. And they mail it back to, well, for us, they mail it back to our district office in Mendota Heights within 15 days, saying that it's been received, corrected, and sent back. Uh, the general rules uh, for load securement 393-100 is where you're going to find it in the federal regulation book. Uh, and to me, load securement is common sense. Because you read the first two statements, it says loaded and equipped and the cargo secured to prevent the cargo from leaking, spilling, blowing, or falling from the motor vehicle. You put it on, you want it to stay on. Common sense, right? The next one is is something that was new, well it's not new anymore, but it came in in 2004. It's when they changed the load securement rules. And this, this was kind of hard for industry to get used to because this is the van trailers and the pickups and that type of stuff that were really, you put it in and you close the door and everybody thought, not going nowhere, it's secure. This basically says that if I put something inside of an enclosed vehicle, if it shifts around in that vehicle and makes the vehicle unstable, I have to secure it within that vehicle. So a good example would be uh, we're using a one-ton truck. It's over 10,000 pounds. I throw two bags of uh, floor dry in the back end. And it shifts around and the bags break open and the floor dries all over the back end of the pickup. Affect the stability of the truck? Probably not. 100 pounds moving around, probably not going to notice it. Okay? Same truck. I take a barrel of oil or a barrel of a hydraulic oil and I'm going to go out and, and uh, change a hydraulic oil or oil on the, all the combines. So I've got this barrel of oil and I lay it down and it rolls, it probably weighs 600 pounds. It rolls from one side of the truck to the other side of the truck every time I go around the corner. You think you're going to notice that? Think it's going to make that vehicle a little unstable? That's where this came in and said, okay, if that's going on, we have to secure that down so it's not moving side to side. Same way if I put something inside of an enclosed van, if it's going to move around, if it can go through the sides or make the trailer unstable, I've got a secure tone. That's kind of the new part of this load securement stuff. Uh, can't leak, blow, spill. This was up in Ada. It's a Norwegian town, you know, because you spell both ways and it still comes out the same. So, but a uh, gap in the end gate and sand is coming out, filling out. So. We do get calls on, people will call. Yeah. Joe Bubbler's going to call if you got stuff blowing out your back end and it's getting on his car. We uh, took one this morning. Yeah, they just, 
lime that's blowing out of the top of a trailer and blowing out. So gravel, we have a lot of gravel moving in this area. So uh, if you notice in this area, a fair number of them are tarped and it's because of the, the enforcement that, that we've done over the years. There was five cars lined up behind this guy with broken windshield from the rocks that were falling off. So. Yeah, he was over single axle. This was uh, up on Wall Street, up in Moorhead here. This guy, he was doing a job in Dilworth uh, raising manhole covers. And you can see that he's got this these concrete rings secured with a sledgehammer in the middle, holding them so that they don't go anywhere. But and then you got shovels. You got the barrel that the barrels get about uh, third full, and he's got a little one inch trap on that. Common sense? Probably not. This was down in Appleton. This was a scrap iron guy hauling uh, cast iron bathtubs and different things. Torches. You notice the oxygen tank up in the top there, kind of leaning the one way. <coughs> Not tied down at all. Uh, performance criteria. Uh, it's really hard for us to determine if you're within the parameters of this roadside because it says that you have to secure for 0.8 deceleration, g force deceleration in the forward direction, 0.5 g force deceleration in the rearward direction, and 0.5 lateral side to side. So if uh, I asked you, what does that mean? What does 0.8 g-forces forward mean to you? Do you know? Anybody know? Okay. A g-force is 100% of the weight of the load moving forward at whatever speed you're going. So if you try to stop, 1 g would be that force of that load trying to stop. So it's telling you that you have to secure for 80% of the weight moving forward, 50% backwards, and 50% side to side. They added another one in here that does working load limit, and that's 0 0.43, 0 0.5, and 0.25. Um, and that basically says the working load limit that you have on the devices has to be basically 50% forward, 50% back. Because people were saying, well, how am I going to know that I'm supposed to go out and get up to 55 and slam on the brakes and see if it holds or, or what, you know? So they put in the working load limit thing and said, okay, if your working load limit meets this, then we're going to consider that you meet the, meet the regulation, okay? There are some load-specific stuff, like your combines, um, 393-130 says that uh, if you haul a machine that's more than 10,000 pounds, you have to have four-point tie-down. And the, the working load limits got to be equal to half the weight of the cargo. Okay, so the combine weighs 50, 40, 40. 40. So your working load limits got to equal 20. And the way they figure them out, and I don't know if I put this in there or not, but the way they figure it out is if I tie directly to the combine, which means I take a chain, hook it in the hook on the rear axle, and I go down to the D-ring on the trailer. Okay? The working low limit, say I've got a grade uh, 7 transport, 3 ace, and it's, what is it, 60, 600 pounds? Okay? but my binder is only 5,400. I'm only going to get 5,400 pounds for that 3 eighths chain because of the binder. Okay, But now, because I'm tying directly to the machine, that's cut in half. So now it's down to 2,700. <coughs> so I got to secure for half, plus I'm halving what I'm putting on there. So it gets a little confusing. Um, what I tell people is if you're going to do a direct tie down where you're going from the trailer up to the load, if you secure for 100% of the weight of the vehicle, the 40,000, in your working load limits, 
you're going to be fine because instead of halving the weight of the load and halving the working load limits of the chain, if you just do 100%, you'll still come out the same. And it's easier to figure out. <coughs> so if I've got a 40,000 pound machine and I put four chains on at 5,400 pounds, I'm not even close. I've got about half of what I need. And a lot of people like three as chains because it's easier to hand. Uh, it just doesn't probably do as good a job as it should. Uh, the other thing you have to do is secure for 20% vertical. <coughs> and, and where we see a problem with this is the guys that uh, load up a skid loader and you'll see the chains going straight forward and you see the chains going straight back. Does that keep it from going up and down? So th the idea of this is to angle your chains down to get the securement. Um, and you got to cover all four directions, forward, backwards, side to side. So angling the chains and angling them down is probably your best way. Otherwise, you're just going to have to add more chains. Uh, prohibition on exceeding the working load limit. Um, you've got to be, uh, they've got to be installed so that everything is within the parameters. You can't exceed the working load limit of the device. Uh, some of the things that you want to consider, especially uh, probably one of the most important things is the anchor points. Where am I tying down to? If I've got a 40,000 pound combine on, do I want to go to a, a rub rail on the trailer that's probably going to be good for 3,000 pounds? Or do I want to use the D-ring that's rated for 12 or 14? You know, so you have to look, and where am I tying down on the combine? Is there a hook on the combine? Or the manufacturers have gotten a lot better about putting uh, places to tie down on the machines. Um, they've got uh, where you can slip the chain into a hook, or they've got a D-ring, or they've got some sort of tie down. Uh, but some of the older stuff, Really, really a nightmare. And some of the trailers for hauling the combines are designed really well for, the, the problem gets to be sometimes you put it on a trailer and the, the, pe the people that manufactured the combine and the people that manufactured the trailer never got together because the D-rings are always in the wrong spot. Um, so you gotta try to, you may have to add more chains. Uh, it never hurts to put more on than you're required to have. You could hook to the frame rail, you could hook to a cross frame, uh, but you've got to be aware that, okay, I'm hooking a half inch chain and the, and the cross frame is eighth inch steel. Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah. Kind you of know, so sense, I mean, right? you've got to think about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. This is a friend of mine up in Michigan, the guy I, I teach for the, the federal uh, government uh, classes in different states and this is the guy that uh, up in Michigan he sent me this picture the, the driver died in this particular accident and you can see what's left of a 3 8 chain right here he had six 3 8 chains on there it's a 60,000 pound machine and he's going on a frontage road he goes under one overpass comes to the next one and says oh crap it's not gonna fit slams on the brakes breaks all the chains, every one of them. Comes forward, crushes and kills him in the cab. I mean, he thought he was doing it right. He put six chains on there because it, well, you're supposed to have four and he put one across the middle and one on the bucket and, and uh, he was about 30,000 pounds short of what he should have had. So. <laughs> this was down in, uh, down in the cities on 494. Uh, happened before I actually started here back in 94. Um, the owner of the dozer was the driver of the truck. He, he owned a construction company and uh, he had taken it in for work, uh, brought it back to the job site. Uh, it was some problems with the steering brakes weren't working right. He got it back there, still wasn't working right. He's frustrated. He dropped, pulls it onto the trailer 
he loops a chain through the back hitch. Just one chain through the back hitch, leaves the, the dozer running, and he's going down the interstate back to the repair shop to drop it off again. And 494, he's, they figured he was doing about 40 miles an hour when he hit the brakes and snapped the 3 8 chain that he looped through the back end and it climbed right up on top of the tires of the truck and onto the cab and crushed and killed him. The one thing I'd show you is the angle of the chain. Okay? It, it's very, the chains are tight, but they go straight across. They're not angled forward or back. And the guy blamed it on the location of the D-rings. It was the only way I could tie it down because the D-rings are there. But you, uh, we had them stop with the, the skid loader on, and it moves back and forth about eight inches. So is that illegal? It wouldn't be secured properly because it, it's not stopping the forward and backward movement. He's not securing it for the forward and rearward movement. He's probably got the side to side covered. And to be honest with you, the best way to secure anything is a four point tie down. The regulation says on something that's less than 10, you only need a two point tie down. But here's the problem with that. If one chain breaks or lets, comes loose, which way is it going? Off the back? or forward into the back end of your truck. So if you use four point and one comes loose, you still have three. Okay. From the D-ring, he could have went to the front and from the front to the back, or somewhere in between those two. Or he could have moved it forward farther. Um, if, if this would have played, you would have saw he had sod up in front and he had some tools up in front. and. Uh, he could have done it differently. He could have moved it forward probably another two feet, which would have given him enough angle to, to keep it from moving. The thing I didn't mention is if you tie direct, you get 50. If you tie, if you go from one side of the trailer to the other, you get 100%. So that's another way for you to, to secure it down and, and get a little more out of your chain. And the reason they gave us on that is is if you go from one side of the trailer to the other, you actually increase the force because you're pulling down for, from both sides and it increases the friction and it's more stable. So that's why they only give 50% when you tie direct because you're pulling to one side. <coughs>